His book is in our library, should be in yours, on the practice of business valuations published by Debu. He is uh, the editor-in-chief of the Canada Valuation Service, and uh, he has been a lecturer at numerous places on this subject, including the University of uh, Toronto Law School as a guest. Uh, and uh, he has been, for many years, involved, as I say, exclusively in this area. The case that um, he and I were involved in involved a business that produced five million baby chickens per year. And uh, one of the neat and narrow points to be determined was the economic consequences of the fact that this particular outfit was not equipped to determine the sexes of these baby chickens the moment they are hatched out. And this is important. They have to be sorted male, female right away. And uh, it is known uh, as chicken sexing in the trade. And if any of you have that problem and wish a evaluator, <laughs> go no further. Your man is here, Ian Kemp. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just about coffee break. How long do you I, I, I forgot to uh, say that right after we are uh, finished, after Ian is finished, coffee will be uh, served outside. And we're running a little behind today. Uh, we were hoping to break for coffee about uh, 3.15. Uh, I think we'll end up going about 3.30, 3.35. That's our idea. No, that's fine, Burke. Uh, my sense of giving a talk uh, to a group like you, uh, particularly given how warm it is in the room and so forth, is that if after 20 minutes or 25 minutes I have left you with two or three ideas or concepts that you can go out tomorrow and adopt and use in your practice, then it's probably been a reasonably effective 20 minute period or 25 minute time period. I have prepared a reasonably detailed paper which will uh, uh, expand considerably on what I'm going to say. It's, a, it's unfortunate in a sense that the overheads that I brought with me do not work because I, I want to try and convey to you one quite difficult accounting concept, and without the overhead that may prove almost impossible, but I'll try in any event. Listening to the last part of the last talk, uh, I presume that you've sat for now a day and a half and had a whole lot of income tax uh, uh, said to you, or however you want to term it. Uh, I deal in essentially two different areas in my valuation practice. I deal with fair market value, a tax term, in a notional sense, that is a, a hypothetical uh, market condition where there is no buyer and seller, and something less than half of our practice, uh, at the moment it runs 30% about, uh, is spent in dealing with Revenue Canada uh, on fair market value determinations, be they for V-Day values, although those are declining in number now, reorganizations and so forth. The balance of our practice is spent uh, principally in advising in commercial transactions where there is an actual buyer and an actual seller. And the principal message I want to communicate to you today is that when you draft your shareholders agreements or other documents for your clients where there are valuation implications, my sense from the documents that I review uh, is that in essence the solicitors drafting them do not frequently distinguish between fair market value in a notional sense, that is a hypothetical sense, and price in the commercial or real world. I can best tell you, uh, I think at least by example, what I'm trying to get at. Without taking a whole long time at it, uh, some time ago I had a client who came to me and said, how much should I pay for this particular business which I have learned is for sale? It was really a very small business, but the principles work the same, big or small. This particular business was doing a volume in 1970, let's say three or four, of $150,000 a year. It was generating about $25,000 of income for the owner operator, uh, was incorporated, uh, paid tax at the low rate, and uh, was generating about $7,500 of income after tax. My client learned of the opportunity to purchase this uh, because he happened to know the individual who owned it and had business dealings with him from time to time. As an aside, most of the good transactions from, purchaser, from a purchaser standpoint are those that happen before anyone else even learns that they're possible. Uh, in this particular instance, in comparing the income statements, my client, who had a very similar business, but a much larger one, could in the first year, we believed, generate about double the volume and could make about 
$50,000 before tax, and in the second year after acquisition, we believe my client could make as much as $100,000 before tax. To make a long story short in analyzing that, I suggested to my client that he could pay as much as $100,000 or $125,000 for that business, notwithstanding it only made for the owner uh, $7,500 after paying him a reasonable salary. My client's comment was, well, that's absolutely crazy if I went to that individual with a $100,000, $125,000 offer, he'd wonder whether I needed my head read and why I was going about doing that. My client walked out of my office, and, oh, and the one other aside is that we very quickly, because he knew his business and I knew it as well, having acted for him previously, we identified three other potential buyers who could do the same thing with that business that my client could do. My client walked out of my office into an adjoining vacant office, phoned the potential vendor, offered him $45,000, providing the deal closed in three weeks. The individual on the other end of the line said, well, that seems reasonable to me. My assets are $25,000. My income stream is $7,500. You're offering me six times earnings. Fine, we have a deal. Now, that happened after 1971 in the new tax system. That vendor was not an informed vendor. Fair market value for income tax purposes assumes a perfect market, a fully informed buyer, a fully informed seller. That person selling in, let's say, 1974 at $45,000 had a capital loss on that transaction for tax purposes. To the extent he didn't recognize he could have realized a higher price in a commercial sense, it is very doubtful that he recognized he had a capital loss when he filed his tax returns the, the ensuing April. It is also unlikely that his advisors, if they subsequently recognized that they could have gotten a higher price, advised him that he had a capital loss. But that little example, which is real numbers, demonstrates as clearly as I can demonstrate for you the difference between a hypothetical fair market value for tax purposes where a perfect market is assumed, fully informed buyers, fully informed sellers acting at arm's length and on and on, and the kind of price that is negotiated in the real world where the purchaser wants to strike the best deal and is prepared to give out what information he has to to do that, and the vendor wants to strike the best deal for himself. Now, having gone through that example, I have a, a rather complex overhead which I'm not sure I can effectively describe to you. and I won't take a long time at it uh, for that reason. I heard reference in the last part of the last talk to so-called premium for control. A premium for control to exist at all must exist in an economic sense. No one pays an amount for control purely to have control. They've got to be able to justify it in economic terms either in their own business or in the business they're acquiring or in a combination thereof. Typically what happens in a commercial transaction is that the buyer is an interested purchaser because he recognizes, or the management of the purchaser recognizes, that there is a business fit with the vendor and that the two businesses together following the purchase will generate or may likely generate more income and more particularly more cash flow than the two businesses can generate separately. And the effect of combining two things to make the one produce a greater result than the sum of the two is called in valuation parlance a synergy or economies of scale. Now, to the extent that price in the open market is based on what a particular purchaser can do with a particular business, anyone who is expressing a valuation view to you and who says there is fair market value without a qualification and does not go on to say to you that there are as many prices as there are buyers is not fully informing you. I, I, I'm being reasonably categoric, but I, I truly believe that there is, that, that, or rather, that there are as many prices for any business interest as there are buyers because each buyer typically has a different reason 
for purchasing and can realize a different advantage as a result of the acquisition. Now, to the extent that there is validity in that comment, we differentiate in the valuation reports that we do between a notional tax fair market value determination and a potential price in a commercial transaction. We seldom quantify price. Price is best identified across a negotiating table. Where that leads me is this. Each of you frequently, or certainly on occasion, are likely asked by your clients to assist them in drafting and finalizing shareholders' agreements. To the extent that you do not recognize the difference between fair market value and price, and to the extent that the accountant or whoever else is advising does not recognize the difference between fair market value and price, the shareholders who enter into the agreement you draft can find themselves in just absolutely uh, difficult situations relative to, to what they anticipate. What we see, and it's, I, 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 I'm seeing a trend to, to, to betterment in this area, frankly, but over the years what I have seen are very poorly worded shareholders' agreements in respect of the valuation clauses. I think that the, 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 the legal fraternity as a group has said, well, fair market value or market value or fair value is something that really isn't within our bellywick. It's something that the accountants are uh, pretty competent to deal with. So, Mr. Shareholders, we are, or Messrs. Shareholders, we will, we will simply put in the agreement uh, fair market value to be determined by. And the shareholders blithely going al go along and think that fair market value is something that is easy to determine. I can tell you of an instance uh, where we advised some people about uh, two years ago where we were dealing with a, with a business that I believed could be sold in a, in a, in a, in a commercial sense. That, uh, I, I want to be very careful. It, 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 was, it was sold in a commercial sense, but it was not exposed to the market. I believe that had it been exposed to the market, it would have commanded approximately twice the price that it was sold to a co-shareholder at, if you can follow me on that. In other words, let's put some numbers on it. Two shareholders came in and one said, I have control, the other said, I'm a minority. The controlling shareholder said, I have decided that at this stage in my time, I want to, uh, to sell to the minority. We put a number of, let's say, uh, have I done with that already? Don't think so. Let's say $300,000 on the whole company. Uh, and let's say that the ratio, to make it easy, was two-thirds, one-third. My comment to the controlling shareholder was, I understand all the reasons you want to do this, and it's an arm's length deal, and the price must be $200,000 for the two-thirds. The reason the price must be that is that the one-third shareholder hadn't got any money, number one, and number two, the business, in essence, has to ingest itself. That is, the, 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 the business then has to provide the money from future earnings, which will not allow it to reinvest that same money in what would otherwise be growth investment. So you, Mr. Controlling Shareholder, have a choice. You either sell to your co-shareholder at $200,000 or you expose your interest to the market. And if you expose your interest to the market, I think you can get $400,000. Now, I spent over a course of 12 months, 12 hours talking, I spent a lot more time than that in the matter, but I spent 12 hours talking to the controlling shareholder on that one single point to satisfy myself that he was making a fully informed decision. In the end, he said, I understand precisely what you're saying. I'm going to give you a letter to that effect. It's of such concern to you, but I'm still going to go ahead. Without that differentiation between fair market value and price, I can tell you that that controlling shareholder most often, that may be unfair, let me say that controlling shareholder may very well have gotten advice saying fair market value is fair market value is fair market value. $200,000 is the right amount to sell at. Now, since business valuation is so subjective, no problem is likely to arise out of that. 
The only time I perceive a real problem arising out of that is if the person acquiring decides to flip his investment within a short period of time. Or if, as has happened on one occasion that I was involved in, uh, immediately after a transaction like that, someone totally unknown to both parties, unknown in the sense of being an interested buyer, knocked on the door and said, hey, we've identified you as a takeover candidate. Now, that is where professionals, lawyers, accountants, people like me, can get into serious difficulty with a client by not effectively communicating the difference between value and price. Now, there's a question as to where the onus is in, in respect of that communication, and maybe it is not on you as a group. But to the extent that you are aware of that difference, I think you can significantly better advise your clients than if you're not aware of that difference. Now, in terms of shareholders' agreements then, and the drafting of shareholders' agreements specifically, most shareholders' agreements do contain some definition of value. What I believe should happen is that the, sh that the shareholders entering into the agreement should have it communicated to them that there is a significant difference between fair market value of the pool of assets viewed as an intrinsic block of assets, that's good terminology, against a possible price that someone might come in from outside and pay. If the shareholders are advised of that difference, because most of them don't know it, okay, there's, a, there's a, a real myth that people know the value of what they have. My experience is that most businessmen spend a lot of time building up their assets, but don't spend nearly so much time thinking about the protection of them and what they've accomplished. To the extent that the shareholder is informed of the difference between fair market value in a hypothetical sense and possible price outside, which probably can't be quantified, then he's in a position to say, draft me up an agreement that says fair market value in the absence of so-called special interest purchaser synergies. Or alternately, the shareholders get together and say, well, we've got a dilemma. On one hand, none of us have any money, so if one of us dies and we can't insurance fund, let's say, uh, we've got to go with a lower number because this business can't afford to buy out one of us because that's what it has to do, subject to reorganization and so on. On the other hand, those people may sit back and they may say, hey, we're all insurable, we have, we have no liquidity outside, but we're insurable. We can fund up to what we believe a special purchaser price might be, in which case they then have that option to consider and do if they want to do it. And the third thing is that maybe they say, hey, we're all very liquid, uh, and we think it's only fair that, that we pay a special purchaser price or somewhere in between, in which case they can do that. But without the differentiation, they don't have an adequate knowledge base to make decisions from. And typically, that information, I suspect from the agreements that I see, has not been conveyed to their client, or to the client. I could give you all sorts of horror stories uh, in terms of shareholders who have said to me, I, one, one will suffice. A group of shareholders who shortly after V-Day came to me and said they wanted to determine the V-Day value of their shares, the valuation day value of their shares. Well, at the end of 1971, Revenue Canada's position was very unclear as to what they were going to do with minority interests. The, the consensus was that Revenue Canada was going to discount every minority because the estate tax uh, federal had just been eliminated, and the professional advisors and their, and their clients had argued for years that minority shareholdings weren't worth anything. I sat down with these four individuals, which owned 25 percent of a private company, in uh, about March or April of 1972, and advised them that while I believed that the on block value of all of the outstanding shares of the company, that is, all of the shares viewed together, might be something in the order of uh, half a million dollars, that each of their one quarter interests was probably for valuation day value purposes, V's Revenue Canada, not likely to be supported at $125,000. In other words, the sum of the parts does not necessarily have to equally value of the whole. These four people sat and they said, uh, that's absurd. Don't talk to us about it. Don't report. They did pay our account. Uh, we believe that we have always worked together as a, an incorporated partnership 
It would never be our interest to do otherwise. There is no such thing as a discount here. A year or two later, I heard that one of the four had died. And there was a point of interest, uh, as a point of interest, the, the estate went and said, OK, the whole value is now, let's say, $600,000. We want 150000 And the three survivors said, minority share interest. <laughs> To give you some idea of the kinds of, of, uh, of, of, of problems and the time involved in solving minority share values, special interest purchaser values, price against fair market value, and this is an unusual one, by the way. I won't, I won't tease you about that. But uh, some time ago, I was involved in a matter involving less than a million dollars of claimed value on a minority shareholding. The matter took four years to resolve. And in aggregate, the two, two parties to the lawsuit paid $700,000 in professional fees. Unfortunately, most of them to the lawyers. Uh, OK, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing in, a, in, a, in a corporate sense some very real changes. And I'm, I'm, I'm overlapping and, and extending into your area. And I apologize a bit for that. But one of the things that is of great concern to to me, and it ties in with shareholders' agreements, it ties in with, uh, with what I think is going to be the trend in the next few years in terms of, of valuation involvement, which, if anything, has to become significantly greater. Uh, there have to be significantly more valuation matters arise because of the uh, minority shareholder appraisal remedies that, are, that have been introduced and that are being constantly strengthened. Uh, one of the issues, of course, comes down to, uh, I don't want to dwell a whole lot on this, but one of the issues comes down to whether, in fact, if, a, if there is a minority appraisal uh, required, whether, the, whether the, the, the fair value or fair price determination should be made as on the basis of the minority being entitled to a pro rata portion of the fair value of all of the outstanding shares of the corporation, or whether the minority should be entitled to the fair value of his or her shares viewed in isolation. And those can be two very different numbers. The uh, BC Corporations Act, uh, while it doesn't specify which of those is the case, uh, there have been cases heard under the, the BC Corporations Act. Wall and Redekop is one. Diligenti is one you may be familiar with, which, uh, 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 and, and Neonex is certainly one, which have, in essence, gone in the direction of saying that the minority is entitled to a pro rata portion a fair value. That is, if, the whole, if all of the shares are worth $100 and the minority has 10 shares, or 10 percent, then the minority shares are worth $10, not something less. Uh, that seems to be the direction of the, that, the, that the drafters of the various corporations acts uh, are going right across Canada. Uh, it is very worrisome, in a sense, because it is going to put minority shareholders increasingly in a position to demand nuisance value. And to the extent that minorities recognize that they may be being put in a position to demand nuisance value, then I could see a very increased number of, of commercial litigation cases on value, uh, which have nothing really to do with income tax. Income tax would generally be a peripheral issue. OK, essentially what I wanted to convey to you this afternoon then, and it's, it's 3.30 and I, I'm sure you're restless and want your coffee. The essential thing that I wanted to communicate to you this afternoon is that it, when you go back to your practices on Monday morning, never again think of fair market value and price as necessarily being the same thing. And if you have taken that message away and you were not aware of that before or were not aware of the importance of that before, then hopefully the last 20 or 25 minutes will be of some help. The paper, as I said at the outset, uh, describes that in some detail, goes through some charts, uh, talks about shareholders' agreements in, in considerable detail, uh, and so forth. Thank you very much.